So as you all know, ladies and gentlemen, what we try to do pretty much every single Wednesday, right around 1 p.m. Eastern, 12 Central, is we reach out to a trader from somewhere in the world and uh, talk with them, learn about what they do, get some insight about their life, find out maybe about their strategies, maybe just pick their brains on some questions. And we have a gentleman uh, who is closely, not related is not the right word, but he, he works with the gentleman that we talked with last week, which was Sean. This is Michael Noss from Trade Ideas. Michael, are you able to hear us okay? Hey, Jeremy. Can you hear me okay? Ooh, dude, you sound crystal clear. <laughs> I think related is a good word with Sean. We, we travel so much <laughs> together at this point that I think uh, – People in the company probably think we're related to it. <laughs> you guys do spend a lot of time together. I mean, he's a cool guy, so that's not a bad thing. Yeah, he's okay. I won't. In case he listens to this, I won't talk him up too much. <laughs> I love it, man. So I'll pull up your Twitter handle so that everyone can kind of get a little bit of introduction on who you are. But give everyone some background, man. Who, you, who, do you, uh, who are you? What do you do? How long have you been trading? All the good stuff. Sure. Uh, I'll try not to bore everyone because I've been, been in it for a long time. But uh, I started trading... 12 years ago, thereabout, um, when I was in university, just stumbled into a job fair and, and you know, uh, across all of the different, um, you know, financial advisor, uh, uh, credit guy, all, all the different things, studying finance and, and psychology at the time, uh, there was a prop firm there that said, listen, we'll, we'll fund you. Uh, anything you lose, we'll eat. And anything you make, you, you make a a small percentage of that uh, and and come on down so you know the interview process was pretty lax it was uh, sit down on the simulator and, and show us that you're good enough to risk some money on and then mm -hmm. and then we'll go from there so I was there for about and this was uh, early 2000s so it was before kind of everything got super computerized and we did a lot of uh, scalping kind of in the same way that um, Sean was talking about right when you you could scalp the bid and you could scalp the ask and and you know the order flow was was visible and real and was there for about yeah a couple of years and then I left to uh, work on the hedge fund space because what happened is as the market got computerized this firm kind of lost its edge and 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 shut down so I went and I worked in the hedge fund space and essentially what I did there was a lot of uh, people would come to our firm and say, okay, I'm interested in investing XYZ hedge fund. Uh, can you go down and just, you know, find out if they're legitimate, what their trading style is, what the, what the risk would be to me and my own portfolio. So it, it gave a very unique insight to kind of both what the prop side of the world was doing working there for a while. And then what the hedge fund side of the world was doing while working there for a while. And this whole time I'd been using trade ideas just as a, as a customer and had no relation to them for the entire, uh, I believe about 12 years. And, you know, then that company got purchased and I went and I started trading on my own again and started my first YouTube video because I was in a trading chat room and somebody wanted me to explain and describe what view app was. Mm. So I just, you know, opened up a, silly youtube channel with a, a silly name and posted that video and, and it got you know ten thousand views or something so i said okay well there's people out there who want to listen you know crazy people out there who want to listen to what i want to say so i just kept making making videos after that and eventually got a phone call from the ceo of trade ideas and said you know we like what you're doing and and at that time i had kind of computerized myself understanding that the market has changed so i was doing a lot of back testing and algorithm building and, and that type of thing. And the CEO said, listen, we're trying to design this artificial intelligence. So can you come and be the trader that it learns from? So from there, I've just been kind of, uh, you know, doing my own trading, doing the, the YouTube channel and mentoring some traders and that type of thing, as well as consulting with trade ideas, uh, traveling around, figuring out what it is that people out there are doing and trying to, to see how we can kind of systemize that and, and computerize that. Mm. And then that and a little bit in the crypto space uh, mm. was, a, was approached 
from a guy down the road and and I see in the in the chat someone saying sounds like Canadian yes I'm from eastern Canada uh, Nova Scotia and there was a guy there who was a big crypto miner and he wanted a, a trader to come in and and trade the the assets that he was created and kind of teach him about some of the derivatives that were kind of popping up at the time in the crypto space so I've been doing a lot of work with that and I continue to work both kind of on the equity side with trade ideas and and on the crypto side with some of my stuff oh nice very cool man that's a I love that background because I mean it, it it sounds like you kind of got thrown into a little bit about the like the algorithms like did you ever have any background in computer science or how did that like no I still can't uh I still can't program a line of code I I, I know nothing about any of that kind of my role with all of these was to be uh, the trader that talked to the system. So in the, in the crypto side of things, for example, I do uh, a lot of market making. I own a, a firm and we're doing market making for Bitcoin on the Jamaican stock exchange, which mm -hmm. has just started to list Bitcoin as the first like national exchange. So you know, I will go and, and talk to that company about what I want to see as a trader and then let the programmers program it. And the same with trade ideas where I'll take, I'll go to uh, conferences like where we met at Jane's thing. Mm -hmm. And I'll listen to guys like you talk about what they do in the market and describe that in a way that the, uh, the programmers can understand. And then I work with like the, the statistical side of things. So I, I do you know, a lot of the math and a lot of the, the, the traditional trader stuff. And then I let the programmers do the programming. Gotcha. That's really good to know. And I think that's, I think that would, that's going to excite some people because a lot of people are afraid about the whole, at least I found that some people are afraid of, you know, kind of going into trade ideas, building some algorithms, linking it up to a brokerage. What do you think holds most people back and from, from doing that? And this is something that I, I try to address a lot, but I think just when people hear, you know, a quantitative trading or algorithmic trading or, or anything like that, they think it's kind of more mystical than it is. So, um, you know, they, they think, okay, I need to learn how to program. I need to know some advanced mathematics, uh, statistics, probabilities, that type of thing. It, where it's not, it's not that at all. Every trader uh, programs and quantifies their trading in some respect, right? So the, mm -hmm. the presentation I saw from you at Jane's thing is you had this uh, this gap doji type of strategy, mm -hmm. and and whether you know it or not, that's a quantitative strategy. That's something that says, okay, this is uh, what it is that I look for. Uh, it's this particular thing, and then you develop these if then scenarios, right? If the stock does this, then I do this, and, and when I'm in it, if it does this, I do this. So that's kind of the basics of quantitative trading already, and and that's kind of where I think a lot of what we, you know, what Trade Ideas does, and, and what I do myself shines is that I don't think that that's the the sole answer right now. I don't think the if there was a way just to hack the the market with numbers, it would have been done by Harvard or MIT or, or someone crazy. But what I think is we're kind of in the, we're not in the self-driving car era of trading. We're more in like the Google Maps uh, mm. trading where it can show you what to look at and it can, sh you know, give you ideas on kind of what rules to trade. But you have to put that in context. You know, we all have, Google Maps tries to tell us to go down that one road in our city that we know is a horrible road to go down that time of day, but the robot doesn't know that. So just being able to say, hey, you know, kind of this is what I suggest, but then I want you to use your eye as a trader. I think that's, that's where people need to kind of demystify algorithmic and quantitative trading. It's just a way to, to put into like a computer language what we're all doing as traders every day anyway. I love that. I think it's a great example and a really good comparison. So when you're trading right now, Michael, are you primarily automated or are you doing a lot of it manual? Uh, many things, <laughs> uh, unfortunately for my psyche sometime, but, uh, 
recently, kind of my my most recent trading journal journey and, and one that I've been showing a lot of my YouTube is transitioning more into swing trading away from day trading. I think it it's fitting my analytical style uh, a little better. But so I, I kind of have two uh, two main styles that I do. So one is, and this is a video I do every week where I pick. Uh, four long stocks, four short stocks, and I enter kind of stop limits to get in if they reach certain prices that I think are interesting. And I let those go for an entire week and then I close them down on Friday and start again. Mm -hmm. And I kind of started this because I was mentoring a trader who was a ambulance driver. And he said, listen, I love what I do. I, I, I never want to quit this job. I, I want to do this kind of thing forever. But at the same time, I want to participate in the market. So you know, he was kind of discouraged and he said, I don't think there's any way to do that without sitting there and watching the screen all day. So we sat together and we came up with this trading style and I asked him if I could share it. And he said, yes. And, and I've been sharing it on that, uh, on that video series and quickly falling in love with it myself where all of the ana an analysis is done at night when the markets are closed and the flash, you know, the, the flashing red and green is off. And then with that, I can plug that into, into trade ideas and have that auto trade it throughout the day. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a hybrid of I'm picking the stocks and then giving it parameters in which to enter. And then from there, it's, it's automated kind of from that area on. Gotcha. So what swing trades are you in right now? Oh, and I, I've got my screen up here. I can show at any time too. Uh, my biggest or my best one right now is NYT, but I bought that a few days ago. So that's not too much of a, of a, yeah, you nice. see that, it's pretty. Yeah. That cluster of dogies down yeah, there. Yeah. Good old I, cluster I, of dogies. Yeah. That's, I'm a big, big, that's, I think one of the things, you know, Obviously, you're you're a great speaker and all that, but one of the things that hit home with me is you're a big uh, candlestick guy too, and and I am as well. I love, I have a whole scan of about 250 dojis that trade ideas will give me every night. I go through every one, and I would oh, say 90% nice. of my trading is based around that. Uh, and also, a, I guess one thing that I entered today for for people who are watching is APY. And that's the same type of thing. So that's be a little bit more recent thing. Mm -hmm. So we've got that cluster of dojis down there. Mm -hmm. So we had a fake out in the morning with that wick. And then as we kind of came up back up above that base, I, I picked it up there. So a uh, little double bottom there on the daily, uh, you know, factored in with. Sure. So that, and I think that's a perfect example, I guess, of my style is that mm -hmm. I have a scan that has a, about a 55 to 57 percent uh, probability that the stock that, that it will move in my direction, but you know that's done off thousands and thousands of of trades, and I don't want to take thousands and thousands of trades. So what I do is I have this alert me throughout the day, and what it's looking for is it's looking for that kind of washout in the morning. That's you know we've seen it a million times. The stock opens up. And it sells down dramatically for the first half hour or so of the day. And then it climbs up throughout the day. So people call it a stop run or, or, or what have you. And so I'm able to see that kind of just get shown to me all day long. And then when I see something like this that I like, I can take it myself. So again, it's that hybrid approach between statistical and, and, and uh, technical. I like that hybrid. That's a, I think that's probably going to be very useful for a lot of people. Yeah, I, I think, you know, again, there's there's so many robots are good at a lot of things, right? They're good at pattern recognition. They're good at uh, uh, systematically dealing with things. They're good at um, uh, removal of emotion, these type of things. What they're bad at is context. You mm -hmm. know, for example, this algorithm knows that there was a flush down that was reversed fairly quickly. So there may be a lot of, you know, uh, people who sold out who are mad, who are buying back and, and all of the, you know, psychological reasons why these things may work, but it doesn't know the sector it's in. And that the fact that there was a double bottom on the daily chart that's gone back as far as August, it doesn't know uh, these kind of more advanced type of things. So 
that's where the hybrid is, right? I add the context where it, it, it shows me the stocks. How long are you normally in your swing trades? I, I don't like um, time horizons, to be honest. Um, everything I back test for a swing trade, I back test for about five days. Okay. I figure that's enough room to pad in some margin for error if I enter something the next day or uh, if I enter it late that day. But for me, it's all about risk reward. You know, I, I've, I've had the pleasure of traveling and talking to great traders like you and, and you know, uh, friends with Brian Shannon and, and mm-hmm. you know, a lot of big name, uh, great guys out there. And they all, you know, a couple of years deep, talk about win rates and all their win rates are about the same. It's the best in the world are at 60, maybe a little bit north of that. And a lot are at like 55, but what makes them, what separates them from everyone else is the risk management. So Mm -hmm. for me, it's not how long am I in the trade? It's how long does the risk management equation make sense? So this NYT, for example, I've got a short term moving average that's following right behind it. And if it wants to close the gap up to 36 bucks and that's going to take a month, I'm going to be in it. If it's going to reverse tomorrow and probably break under 30, I'm going to be out. So it's less about the, the time more about the price, I guess, probably the best way. Yeah. To do it. That makes a lot of sense. What moving average will you use? You mentioned kind of, kind of the, like a moving average that it kind of follows. I'm not a big, I'm not, I don't really believe in, in technical indicators. And I always like to kind of put that forward. I know that's divisive for a lot of people. Um, on my chart, I have the technical indicators that everybody watches for the psychological reasons. So the, the 20, the 50, and the 200. For my short-term moving average, it's the eight exponential. Uh, really no magic behind it. I, I trade it with a guy uh, over Skype for years who's more mm-hmm. by it. So it's one of those things that's just been on my chart for so long. I just leave it there. Sure. And it, it does seem to do a pretty good job of, of trailing price when that, when it's separated too much, uh, it may be time to look to take profits and it usually does a good job of, of directional kind of indications. Gotcha. No, that's, that's very useful. And so from there, you don't use anything else like no Bollinger Band, MACD, anything like that. No, I, I think, these have their place and, and I will use them in the, the scans that I build and the algorithms that I build. But I think personally, they do a good job of, of telling us what not to be in as opposed to what to be in. So I don't think anyone should short a stock because, you know, the stochastics and the RSI are high and it's outside its upper Boilinger band, but it may be an indication that you're chasing at that point. So it, you know, not so much what to do, but what not to do. Mm, gotcha. That's, that's useful too. Cause I mean, that, I'm, I'm very similar to you, man. I mean, as far as candles and sentiment, like I'm just trying to find really, really good patterns that I like. And I love this one on New York times. Like I, I didn't see this, obviously I'm not in it, but being able to kind of analyze it, I think that I would have been, you know, I mean, you have this really nice bearish candle here that immediately reversed. So you, you know that there were some people who got in bearish thinking it was going to go lower. Mm-hmm. And then this guy comes down like two pennies lower than this low. So what you have is you have people who got in bullish, who got stopped out. And then you got people who were in bearish who finally got a chance to get a penny gain who got out. So yeah. the low of this candle is 27.35, low of this candle is 27.38. So you have like this really, really small, just total blip. It just traps a lot of people. And then the very next day, phenomenal bullish candle, great gap. This kind of forms a hammer, comes back, retest that. And then again, just a beautiful consolidation. I mean, that, that's gorgeous. So yeah, that, that, would be, that would be a trade that I would take 100 times out of 100 times. Yeah, and, and that's basically the exact same logic I used. Um, you know, I, again, I'm, I'm using... Uh, trade ideas for this when we have something that's called a single stock window. I use Trading View, uh, which I'm seeing there as well for uh, all the crypto stuff. Mm. And we've got this single stock window that has some certain statistics and, and fundamental data. So I take a look and I know that it's November 6th until earnings uh, very easily. And then also it's about a 13% um, short float, which represents about 13 days to cover. So that's another metric that I like to use a lot. Um, you know, I'm like you where I think the psychology of both 
myself as a trader and the trading psychology of all the other traders out there dictate pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, short float percentages, things like that make, make a fair amount of sense to me as well. Is that something you use a lot short float? Uh, yeah, again, it won't be a determination for a trade, but it will be a, it will be a kind of addition to it. You know, if, if I took a look at this particular setup and the short float was 1%, I don't think I would ignore it, but I wouldn't be as excited with a short float of, uh, 30. 13% and then days to cover is, is 13, which again, if any of your people don't know, days to cover is just a metric to say, if all of the trading that occurred in this stock was people covering shorts, how many days worth of volume would have to occur before all the shorts were out? So, you know, when that gets up there, it, it's, it means that there's, you know, a fair amount that if something happens, you know, you can get a lot of short covering behind you. Yeah. Do you do anything over earnings like on Tesla or you do, you do wait after, do you do any option volatility plays or what does that look like in your trading? No, I think that's a, like a 2020 goal for me because fondly enough, I have, um, I'm a chartered alternative investment analyst and up here in Canada, I have a certificate in derivatives market strategy. And both those are just, you know, I needlessly fancy titles that just say I've, I've done a lot of study on derivative securities and options and futures all the way to uh, fixed income and, and swaptions and credit default swaps and all of this. But I, like, I guess a lot of people who are now traders that had degrees and letters after their names, I don't use any of it. So that's one thing I kind of want to get into is more options playing uh, down the road. Nice. Oh, that's good to know. Um, yeah, if you ever have any questions on that, man, reach out to me because I don't, uh, I haven't studied it to that degree, so I probably wouldn't know as much as in that realm. But as far as the actual impl implications of things, I mean, I, I do a lot of option trading. So, well, and it's just like any other kind of trading where the the amount you studied in school about the stock market doesn't really <laughs> mean, doesn't really mean too much when you get into it. Yeah, that is definitely accurate. So, how often do you find yourself optimizing uh, your algos? I have basically a, a series of, um, you know, six or seven that I look for. And the way I treat them is I treat them kind of like I'm, I'm the manager of a used car uh, salesman. You know, I'm a used car lot owner and, and they're my salesman. So I'll, if someone's having a bad week, I'll, I'll quote unquote talk to it. So I'll go look at it and I'll see maybe it's just this market that it's not working in. Maybe it's, um, you know, may, maybe it's the, uh, the environment. Maybe there's just a quick little tweak I can do. If I have to optimize it too much, then I don't want to at all. It's, you know, I, I believe in simplicity in trading. If, if what you're doing is far too complicated, I think it has a higher chance of failure. So I try not to optimize very much at all. You know, what, what I'll do more is I will uh, rotate. So if one of the algos is back testing very well and it's performing very well, I will remove the one that's performing poorly and just, you know, bench it for a couple of weeks and then test it again and see if it's kind of coming back to life or not. Mm, gotcha. That's uh, so how many, how many will you have open at any one given time? How many uh, algos running or how many trades? Algos, yep. Uh, I think four is a good number to, to manage. Um, you know, again, I, I don't want to be, I remember the days where I used to day trade, you know, 200 times a day and, uh, you know, feel like you got hit by a truck at the end of the day. Mm. So I, I try to limit that more for, for mental sake. Now, one thing I'm doing right now is I'm building uh, two new um, additional AIs, which I'm pausing on because I don't know. I'm, I think I'm allowed to talk about it. If not, you're, you guys are getting, I guess, an exclusive, <laughs> uh, exclusive look. And I'll, I'll answer for it later. But uh, one of them is uh, looking at gaps and it's looking at uh, high relative volume more than anything else. And the other one is a swing trading um, artificial intelligence. So as I'm building these, they've gotten past the stage where it's all paper money. And what I do is I start trading them in my live account very small. 
So right now I'm a bit busier than I normally am just because. Um, but yeah, usually I try to limit it to, to like four. I love that, man. No, that's great because yeah, you're definitely right. That's the conception or at least perception that I get when I tell people I day trade. They're like, oh, you are in front of the computer all day and take a million trades. And I know you were kind of listening in for a little bit before I got back from picking up a friend at the airport. But it, I mean, I take usually three or four trades a day. Um, very rarely will I take more than that because it's just easier for your mind. It's easier for your account. Usually it's less things to manage. And some people, they're, they're rare, but yeah, they can do 45 trades at once. I just don't know that many people who do it that well. And it's like, you could always try it out. You can always test it just to see if you're that skilled or that gifted. But, uh, and if you are, that's amazing. But I'm just not. <laughs> yeah, it, it's that. And I also just find burnout hits a lot, a lot quicker. You know, I'm very um, big on, on my routines. You know, I've got a couple of routines. As someone who works for themselves and works from home, I think it's important. Um, and I, I've just... I've done as, as big of a nerd I am, I've done statistical studies kind of on myself and and the days that I get too uh, overwhelmed, right. The days I get too, uh, uh, you know, too in the weeds, too focused Mm -hmm. on the trading and less focused on, you know, the longer term picture, uh, the worse I do. So that's one of the main reasons for it. I love it. No, it makes, that makes loads of sense. It really does. So when you're talking about you're doing your statistical like reviews on yourself, how, how do you do that specifically? Uh, journaling, you know, I, I, I think every trader should have some sort of a journal. Uh, again, being a nerd, mine is a journal and a spreadsheet. So for example, I would record um, some simple metrics about myself is okay. Have I uh, been outside <laughs> Before the, before the market opens has a, have I taken my dog for, for our daily run? Have I, have I meditated before the open? And then what was my performance uh, at the end of the day? And, and what did I feel like? And, and trying to quantify all of these and did that for about six months and found that the days that I roll out of bed, uh, sit down at the computer and start working, my performance was way worse than the days that I, I set my alarm, you know, maybe an hour early and went for a run out in the woods. You know, I own a, a pretty big property uh, just in the, in the middle of the woods where I can't see or hear anyone. So every time we're out and uh, the times that I, I meditated and all of this, the performance was much better. So kind of the way someone would optimize a strategy, kind of looking to optimize myself because even if I am completely automated trading, which I don't do a whole lot of, I'm still the one that built the strategy, right? So mm. it still kind of all starts with, with the human. Yep. Man, that's really cool that you, that you track all that. Is there, is there an app out there that you know that reminds people all the things they should be tracking or do you, do you think that exists? I, I do. Uh, uh, I think it's called things three or something. I have a, you know, one of those iPad pros with the pencil on it and I just keep that next to my bed and I wake up and I have a checklist of things that I have to do every day. And then I write down, you know, three things to do for um you know the the market making firm for the crypto that i own uh three things to do for uh, the trade ideas consulting right three and i just keep uh, of kind of the categories of my life and one of those is just kind of health and well-being right so it's usually uh, drink two liters of water uh hit the gym and 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 meditate and then i just what was it called i think it's called things three i I, okay trying to that's pretty cool yeah. And it, it's, it's got a little, you know, like widget or something on it and you can make checklists and, and notes to yourself. And, um, but no, I'm pretty old school with that where I don't like pen and paper, but I do, you know, iPad and Apple pencil is the same kind of thing. Yeah. Optimizing yourself is something that a lot of people just don't talk about or kind of glance over, but it, it that's the key is you got to try to figure out what, you know, you know, like if someone's losing money or they're not trading as well as they did in the past or something, it's like, what changed in your life? We got to analyze that first and then find what we can tweak. Yeah. And I think that came from my uh, prop firm days where, you know, everything was done manually. Uh, That's when I was doing 200 plus trades a day, just an absolute madman. 
it, it was more um it was more kind of weighted for everything was on you because there was no automation there was no statistical analysis there was no nothing it was all about what what you saw when you read the tape we didn't even look at charts then mm -hmm. uh, very much so it was you would notice these things and people would say for example hey i i'm going to take the week off i broke up with my girlfriend or something which are you know big events in your life and i started to watch that and then i noticed that okay well if big events in your life make a big difference to your trading well maybe small events in your life make small difference in your trading nice. and in a game like trading where you know if you got 1.5 r out of your trade as opposed to 1 that's a big difference. If you got 1.7 R, then that's a huge difference over the life of a trader. That's so true. That's so true. And like those small things can add up. And the challenge is just finding what are the, what those things can tweak and not tweaking too much. But self-optimization, man, that is, that is massive. It's huge and it's not sexy, which I, I think is why people don't talk about it. It's not it's not sexy uh, at all. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's the, the fact that I, that you get up and you know, you're not feeling too well, but you went for the gym anyway. That's not, that's not something anyone's going to make a YouTube video next to their Lamborghini or anything about, right. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's not going to impress anyone, but, uh, so, but it's important, right? Because at the end of the day, it's, you have no boss. That's what my trading mentor always said. He said, there's going to be no one who comes and taps you on the shoulder when you do something stupid that's going to ruin your life. So you got to make sure that you're that guy, you know, so, always. Yeah. yeah, that's the key is the, it sounds morbid, but the ruining your life part is hundred percent accurate <laughs> because mm -hmm. you can easily at any point in time do something really, really dumb as a trader and just boom, there it is. It's gone. Like that can, that can happen at any given day. Well, and, and you talk to traders as much as I do. It's very rare that you hear a horror story from a trader, which started as, you know, I developed a, a plan and I, I followed that plan religiously and now I lost my house. It, it, it's always, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, did, I, I screwed up guys. Yeah. Yeah. It's always just, I, I, I was doing everything right for X period of time. And then one day, I don't know, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed or something. I went crazy and, and that's it. Yep. Right? Yep. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. It is though it's that like calmness before the market and before the storm that just kind of helps you go, okay, cool. I mean, let me just rein it back in for a little bit and take some breaths. You got to realize that maybe sometimes as a day trader, you won't take any trades, right? Like yesterday for me, I didn't take one singular trade. And it's kind of rare. I mean, it doesn't happen often, but it, sh but it should. It should happen ever so often. At least once or twice a month, if you're a day trader, you shouldn't take a trade every single day because it, number one, you gotta, you gotta try to prove to yourself that you can build that discipline. But number two, if you don't trade, you don't lose, guaranteed. Well, yeah, and, and that's actually something that my, one of my, my original trading mentors always, always said, he said, you'll know when you make it, when you sit there for an entire day, watching the markets, you know, uh, scanning, doing everything you normal do, and you don't do anything. Mm -hmm. that, you know, mm -hmm. that was kind of his threshold. And he said that that's when you're less about, I want to make sure that there's, you know, a, a green P and L at the end of every day. And, um, more about, uh, you know, more about, I, I didn't see anything. I didn't see anything that was worth, I think it's Warren Buffett who talks about, um, you know, you, you can stand at the plate all day and you never have to swing the bat. Yep. You know, so it's, it's a big, it's a big deal. Absolutely. And for go, for those of you guys, yeah, feel free to subscribe to Michael's YouTube. A lot of people that I interview don't have YouTube channels. Some, you know, some people do, but um, I apologize. I was not previously a subscriber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw that. And, yeah. and forgive my awful branding. That's another 2020. I'm currently taking my CMT and I finished that in, in yeah. the beginning of 2020. I'm going to do a big rebrand and, and pretty all that up. Dude, CMT. I thought about yeah. doing that one day. I, I, I still might. I could. Um, what's your goal with it? Is it just to have it to be cooler or you, you think it's going to be super useful? It, have it have it to be not so much to be cooler but uh <laughs> you know trade ideas was gracious enough to uh to pay for all of it they just oh, kind nice. of want somebody sure they want somebody to, to help 
you know, more or less kind of get them into the club. And, and it is interesting because it forces me to look at things that I, I never, ever looked at because, you know, I just didn't believe in them or my trading mentor didn't believe in them. Um, like what, like point and figure charts or point and figure charts was a big one. I, I, I kind of, I still play with them, especially in the crypto space. I've been playing with them. They're interesting. Um, uh, Elliott wave theory, I, I never subscribed to, but it seems to have kind of some merit, uh, different indicators. Again, I'm not really an indicator guy, uh, to be honest and uh, knowing you and, and what you know about the market is probably the same as me. It's more about learning to what they want you to call things and and what they want you to say, as opposed to learning a lot about the market. But I do like something that kind of pushes me away from what I've normally known for what the market is and said, well, you know, now you're forced to look at uh, line charts, which I never looked at or point and figure charts, which I never looked at and, and correlational uh, analysis, which I've never really played with. And, you know, sometimes it's good to have someone force you go in there because I might be right and all those things might not be useful for me, but I might find something that, that you know, again, the, the small win, it takes my my average win from 0.7R to 0.75R. Multiply that out for the amount of years I have left doing this and, and that could be a big difference. Definitely. So what's your, do you have a, do you have a monthly or weekly goal or daily goal as far as gains or do you just kind of trade whatever happens whenever you see? I, I hate, I hate the goal thing. I really, I, I've been caught in the same trap that I think every single trader watching this has been in where you say, okay, I want to make $10,000 a month. So that means I need to make this amount of week and this amount of day. And the issue is that you know, it, I find the 80, 20 principle applies a lot in trading where, you know, 80% of your profits are going to come from 20% of those, those trades that really hit it out of the park. Well, dude, that uh, for example, to wait for those. Oh, it does. <laughs> That's so damn hard, man. <laughs> well, I remember when we met was at Jane's thing, we were at supper together and that's when crypto was ripping. Yep. And it, it was, it went from like, we were sitting at the table just going nuts because I think wow. it went up like, you know, a thousand points or something or 2000 points. Dude, something I can take it insane. to the exact day. Yeah, I know. I know exactly. Yeah. For precisely just going bananas, but that, that was the, the beginning of the end. Yeah. Basically. And well, and I remember that to that date, I was a negative on my crypto trading. Mm -hmm. Um, and about, I actually had a buy order in above that, that same little congestion, that little red candle that's right below where you drew those arrows Yeah, that got me in that. And then I think later at the event, I had a pretty nice Litecoin short and it was those two trades just completely changed the entire year. So you're right. It sucks waiting for them, but that's why I don't really like the goal thing because, you know, I had been trading, uh, Bitcoin when it was down in that you know three to four thousand dollar range and getting chopped up, knowing that this thing's going to trend one way or another at some point soon. So as long as I'm managing my risk responsibly, eventually I'll get I'll, I'll get a big move. Um, and yeah, so that's I just kind of take it as it comes, and that's part of it. You know, again, I, I feel lucky to be working it and be consulting with trade ideas, and then again the the, the other adventures I have on the go, uh, which I do think is important for people to make sure that there, there's a way for you to live without having to put on a trade because, you know, like we just talked about some days, some weeks, some months, it's just not going to be there. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know, man, I get it. And you're, you're definitely right. I know it's a big speculative question, but what's your, what's your thoughts and opinion on Bitcoin since I have the chart up? So I, I was lucky enough um, to actually kind of not so much call, but I, I talked about in a couple of my videos and got a nice short as we broke that uh, descending triangle there around, you know, 93, 9,500. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, I think I'm like everyone else where I'm looking at that $6,000 area because that's where we broke down from uh, last year you know, that, that big mm -hmm. crash we had. So I think that's an area that has to be defended. Uh, I'm not 
excited for what happens if that that, ha- that breaks, because I, I think we may be going lower than than that base, than that three thousand base. We might be going I don't, to a thousand. I, I don't know. Um, but if we can hold and and build a base above six thousand, then I'm I'm really really bullish. And you know I I know as as someone who's you know, again, owns companies in the industry and works in the industry and, and I should be kind of a permable, but I, I think I may even be always tilted a little bit bearish as, as almost a hedge on my life, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm more excited about the technology than the actual uh, uh, coin itself, because for example, the the Jamaican stock exchange, it's going to list Bitcoin and Ethereum and, and you can sign up for that. And I can give you a link or, or your followers a link if they, if they want to trade it there. Um, but they're also going to do STOs, which I'm sure you heard of, but if, if, if anyone watching hasn't, they're basically like an IPO, but instead of with uh, a stock, you know, a, a piece of paper held in a, held in a bank somewhere, it's done with cryptocurrency. So that kind of stuff interests me because how cool would it be is if I could just, you know, send you a share of, of Apple for payment for something or as a gift or whatever, and you could hold it instead of holding it at a bank, you could hold it inside of a wallet. Um, you could transfer, you could use different company stocks as maybe payments for things. Uh, it would make it so that these securities could be traded on literally any exchange. Mm-hmm. You know, if, as soon as they STO on one exchange, they could move to another, which means that more participants could be involved in the market, kind of regardless of country. Um, so I think the technology is great. I, I just don't know about the actual coin. And for that, I'm trying to, I try to distance myself and be just a price action guy there, like I am with everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm, I'm thinking with you on that one. Like the, the actual coin itself is like, who knows? We'll see. But, uh, you know, over the long term, I think it'll eventually accumulate. Like if you can make an argument that this is some type of massive triangle thing, you know, or we, whatever, we just kind of pop in here. But the, the, the cool news is, I mean, we have the opportunities to still trade it. I mean, if it keeps going down, short it. Who do you short through? Is it Kraken or somewhere else? Uh, cr- Kraken primarily. And that's mm-hmm. more of, so, you know, again, a little little history of, of me and, and, and crypto, which some people might find interesting is that I miss the initial craziness. I, I joined crypto in, uh, I think it was like April, 2018. Mm-hmm. So if you go to that on a chart, that's well after the initial nutsness. I just didn't pay attention. I just wasn't really focused on it until, you know, this guy who was literally down the road from me in kind of my fishing village here in Canada, uh, posted something and, and I went to, to chat to him about, about being a, you know, the, the trader for his, his mine. And it's kind of cool what we actually built. And this is just one of the companies that I'm associated with, with crypto was a, uh, insured bank. So if there's anyone out there who wants to contact me, who has a whole bunch of crypto that they want to store somewhere and have insured by, uh, I don't think I'm allowed to say the name, but an actual large insurance company that you would know. Uh, we ended up building that nice and, and at the whole time during this this phase was kind of my introduction to it so i think that's kind of where i don't have that uh that permable attitude is because i joined the 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 world telling people that there was this giant descending triangle happen and if we broke six thousand, then it was going to be really really bad and and kind of pounding that that table as hard as i could um, so I, I think that gives me kind of a neutral, a neutral stance. And then it was from that, that company with the bank, um, and all of the work I've done with that, that I got introduced to the Jamaican stock exchange and, and working as the, the market maker for that. So it's, it was, it was a wild ride. It was a wild yeah. couple of years for sure. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing, man. I love yeah. it. And do you, I mean, you, you mentioned one way of associating the blockchain with, you know, the stock market and things like that. Do you ever see the market itself being switched to a blockchain? Like instead of transactions being over the internet, it's all based on some type of backing or some type of coin where all the transactions are on the blockchain. 
I, I hope so. You know, I, I, my, my equity trading is with interactive brokers because right now it's the only exchange that, um, that trade ideas will link to for the auto trading. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're looking at different uh, zero commission providers now because we were partnered with them when they were the cheapest and now they're not. So, yep. um, I hope so. And, and that's fine, but I don't know where my share certificates are, right? If interactive brokers gets hacked or goes down or, or whatever, these swing trades that I talked about, my New York time shares, I don't really know anything about them or where they are. So I think the tokenization of trading is inevitability. I think the next big move in trading is going to be 24 hour markets. That's uh, the reason that these Bitcoin futures, in my opinion, have failed. Like why would you ever trade a 24 hour market using an instrument that closes? And with, you know, extended hours getting longer and more active, it, it only makes sense to me that eventually it's going to go to a 24 hour market. And then if there's any kind of crazy hack that occurs, then I think it's going to be kind of ish interesting to tokenize the securities, but it's really all going to depend on the regulators. And, you know, you guys uh, in, in the States, it's weird that Canada is usually way more regulated when it comes to, you know, opening a bank and, and all of these things, but you guys are actually way more regulated when it comes to, individuals and, and how the markets trade and how the markets move like the the pattern day trader rule for example it doesn't mm -hmm. exist up here in canada yeah yeah you're right um so it'll be interesting to see how much resistance there is to it but uh, you know the, the the technology is amazing for uh uh for staking you know what that one of the companies that i'm that i'm working with the one that has that that bank that crypto bank that they built um some brilliant cybersecurity experts there and they're looking at uh, at the new staking that has come out for coins as an alternative to mining, and they believe that's going to be the next big thing, and that will open up the the industry to absolutely everybody who has even the smallest amount of money. They don't need a a mining rig. So once that happens, I think the industry is going to be open for a kind of a big change. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's really insightful, man. I appreciate sharing that with us. And that's, uh, that's super cool. That I, I think to just think through like what 10 years looks like down the road. And that's, I've been making an interesting statement recently and I know I kind of, I'm kind of writing on the back of, of uh, Warren himself, but I don't see how the Dow Jones doesn't hit a hundred thousand in the next 30 years. Um, I tell people 50 years just so it doesn't sound as crazy or as insane, but <laughs> I mean, it just seems so likely because again, with more trading now, now you have less commission. Okay. So you yeah. have less commission. Now you have the, the, the mom and the pop stores who are like, Oh, I've been terrified of trading the market. You wouldn't think that commissions would hold people back, but it does. And I think they said TD Ameritrade has like 48% new accounts got open. Now they've lowered their commissions. And so wow. you're going to have all of these people that are interacting with the market. They're just buying $10 here, $10 there. But as they're doing that, I mean, if you take, a billion people that put in ten dollars of stock into something that's ten billion dollars i mean or, or even more than that sorry yeah that, that's that's massive that can move a market that can start adding liquidity that can cause markets to go higher and then with inflation and more trading and more active trading and bigger and bigger companies i don't just see, i don't see how it doesn't happen and the thing is you know if we go back to just 2000 and let's just say 2012 for giggles you know, we've doubled more or less. The Dow Jones has doubled mm -hmm. and that's seven years. So obviously we're going to have a 30, 40, 50% pullback at some point in time, but let's just say 30 years from now, what you, you don't think we could double again and then double again. It's like, that's very likely. Oh yeah. Especially like if you click on that chart uh, on the bottom right-hand corner on the log function to look at it, log, it makes it even more, um, you know, that's a, a logarithmic way instead of just a new or a arithmetic way, I guess, to look at charts and it makes it look just even more extreme. And I, I don't think there's any reason why we couldn't same with uh, Bitcoin. I don't think there's any reason why it couldn't go to a hundred thousand at some point. Again, I'll be following the, the price action the whole time, but it's the same thing we're trying to do with, uh, with this company and the Jamaican stock exchange is right now. If you talk to most people on the street, 
they they can't trade or they're or they're not going to go through the effort of opening a, a you know a kraken account or a coinbase account or a, an itbit or any of these weird companies they haven't really heard of but if we can prove this concept on the Jamaican stock exchange and have some of the other ones take notice, imagine if we could, and this would be awesome for me. It would be awesome. I think for the industry as a whole, if on the Toronto stock exchange or the New York stock exchange, you could actually just go buy Bitcoin. And Mm. so now it's opened up, not just to the people who are willing to go through the time and the effort and send the money and all of this to, these weird quote unquote exchanges, you know, some in in Korea and some in China and God knows where, but if you could just open up your Robinhood app, which I know they, they do allow crypto trading, but your E-Trade, your Fidelity, your TD Ameritrade, and just click button and actually own a Bitcoin. uh, I think that's going to be kind of the next big catalyst that we need to really push the market up. Yeah. And the same thing with, this zero commission thing it does the same the more people you let into a market the more liquid that market's going to be and regardless of whether you're an investor or trader that's just going to be good for you anyway agreed yep totally agree man incredible conversation and like many people like i i I say this a lot but i feel like i could we could just chat for another five six hours so i I appreciate your time man immensely i know we've been back and forth on twitter for a while and it's, it's well, I say back and forth, I mean, like it's always good to just have conversations with you. I, I like talking to you. You're a nice guy. I like people who trade and who are just down to earth and who like helping others and growing and doing cool things and educating. And that's, you're certainly a person I would consider in that realm. So just thank you for your time, Michael. Oh, I love it. I, lo- I love educating. You know, I, I, I've been following your YouTube channel and, and, and Twitter and everything since we met. So uh, some really cool stuff in there. I like the, I like the monthly challenges. I like the focus on on your health and and the community and, and, you know, volunteering and helping others. And it's just, you know, we're, we're all, we're never getting out of this alive. Right. So, you know, I I like, I like guys who, you know, they want to make an impact out there. So I think, I think that's amazing that you do that. And anytime you want to chat, I'm, I'm around for sure. Done. Thanks so much, man. And again, I know we've talked about it in the future and I, I definitely plan on doing some more things with you as well. So, yep. Appreciate you immensely, man, and have a fantastic rest of your week. Awesome. Thank you very much again. Yeah, dude. My pleasure. So, folks, there he is, one of the beautiful geniuses behind the scenes, so to speak. Um, if you have, if you want to get access and reach out to him on YouTube, feel free to subscribe to his YouTube channel or follow him on Twitter. I do both now. I've been following him on Twitter for a while, but he does post some great, uh, some great content, some great posts on his, on his Twitter feed. So it's uh, just another person out there that we'd like connecting with. As far as trading goes, uh, I'll do a really, really quick review, but we took our trades and uh, we're done. I mean, done for the day. I think most people, you're up small, most likely. Uh, Boston Scientific, beautiful bounce. I did not notice that it was bouncing off the 200 simple on the daily. I, did, I was unaware of that. 39.77, that would have been a fantastic spot to go long. <laughs> that was pretty much the low of the day on BSX. Texas Instruments, we did about as good as we could have. So we made some money on Texas Instruments. Service now uh, did trade down to that lower level that I was anticipating, and again, just slowly bounced. So it's been a little bit of a slower day for the most part, but a profitable day. Uh, congrats to anyone who picked up AMD off of $30.98. That was brilliant. Boeing had a beautiful double top. And iRobot is coming into your guys' target. Uh, again, I'm not in this particular trade, but um, looks like 49.24 is the ultimate target. Your new stop loss is 47.94 on iRobot. And look at this. 5% at 4860. So that has been hit 4860 on the nose. And now you guys are going for 4924, which makes sense. So I hope you can get there. Again, I don't personally have a target or a trade right now on iRobot. Uh, and that's totally fine. WDC does look a little on the weak side. Maxar Technologies was a great follow through. And LK, a few people are watching LK to potentially break out of this consolidation. And I actually do like that setup on LK. 
Uh, I would trade it if I had the risk available and I just, I don't at this particular point in time have the risk available to take that trade. But if you're looking at it, few people are keeping a real close eye on something like that. Although I most likely could lose less than an R on this particular trade, less than a risk unit. And you heard Michael also talking in R's, which I just love that anyone talks to risk units. Uh, LK, 2010 by 2080, you most likely could lose less than one risk unit. But since I have only up 0.2 on the day and didn't take anything yesterday, I think I'll just slowly coast into um, Thursday. Square, we missed a phenomenal options trade by a dime by one singular dime on Square. So that's kind of lame. Adobe, another miss by pennies. High of the day was 26552. So we missed Adobe twice now by less than 30 cents. So that is just magnificent to notate on Adobe. And, uh, and then we got CBL. CBL swing trade, which is really, I mean, that's, about as perfect as a consolidation as one could ask for. Really excited to see what happens on Tesla earnings. Kind of excited about it. We'll be keeping you all abreast on that situation. But I'll be, uh, I'm out for the rest of the day. I got a coaching session with my trading mentor in about 30 minutes. And yeah, about it. I'll see you guys later. Until next time, love life, live life, and trade. Bye.